What I want to do today, we're going to talk about Vonnegut, obviously. Um, with the last half of class or so, we're going to talk a little bit about Jarvis. You didn't have to read that for today, so don't freak out. But I do want to kind of introduce you guys to her because she is the second text we're using. I feel like it's going to be kind of important. So we'll, we'll address that a little bit today. What I want to start with, I just want to open the floor in the off chance. Anyone had any sort of moments in the text that they thought uh, were particularly interesting or they had questions about, they weren't sure about, or anything like that, anything at all relating to the book. I just want to open the floor before, because I got notes, I got stuff I can talk about. But anything you guys were like, I had a question or I had a, a thought, anything like that? All right, let's talk about what I want to then. To begin with, on page 193 in the big book, uh, does anybody have a small book? No? No? How big is yours? I know that's weird, but it matters. Okay, you're good. You're using an e-copy? Okay. I'll give you a phrase you can look for. 193. I think technically it, it starts at the bottom of 192. Uh, if you look up there at the corner, and there's a comma after corner, so that should probably take you to, uh, to our paragraph. All right, so some context first. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm going to be doing this a lot. <clears throat> the context here, the American POWs are basically being marched into Dresden, okay? They, they are headed to the slaughterhouse. Um, of course, to live there, not to be slaughtered, although it is a, an interesting sort of metaphor that. But they're being marched there. That's where they're going to live. They're walking through Dresden. They've just left the POW camp they were in. And here's what's really important to what we're going to read. Remember, they were, they were given clothes when they left, right? Does anyone recall, Billy in particular, was given like a certain kind of clothes. He looks a certain kind of way. Does anyone remember this? Because the narrator points it out a few times. Like I'm not looking for spe specifics necessarily, but does anyone recall sort of what Billy looks like? He's given a jacket that's like three sizes too small. Uh, it has fur details on it. He looks ridiculous, right? At various points, we call him a fool or a clown. He just looks silly. All right, so the paragraph. They're at the corner, and they're, they're in Dresden, remember. They're at the corner, in the front rank of pedestrians was a surgeon who had been operating all day. He was a civilian, but his posture was military. He had served in two world wars. The sight of Billy offended him, especially after he learned from the guards that Billy was an American. It seemed to him that Billy was in abominable taste. Suppose that Billy had gone to a lot of silly trouble to costume himself just so. Okay. So we've already said that Billy looks foolish. Like, he looks very silly. Why is this German surgeon offended? Like we use that word. He's offended by the way Billy looks. He even approaches him in the very next paragraph and says, I take it you find war a very comical thing. Why do you guys think he's so offended by the way? Just Billy hasn't opened his mouth. Billy hasn't said anything. Why is he so offended by that, do you think? Let's take another tack. So, we've talked about being offended before in this class. Does anyone recall when we did that? We've talked about a character being offended before. <coughs> no. Okay. It was, it was before we ever read this book we talked about this character. He was offended. Deeply offended by another character. Is that ringing any bell? Was it the poem with like the guys that were that like more friendly to 
don't remember the exact term. Walk around naked. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> they get naked at one point. Um, yeah, yeah, you remember that poem? For the guys, to quote another student, walk around naked. Naked and, and naked, by the way, have very different connotations. If you're naked, you're up to something. It's true. Anyway, beauty, Fairchild poem. Who do those guys offend in that poem when they disrobe in the middle of the machine shop? Do they offend anybody in that moment? The workers. What? The workers. Yeah, but one guy in particular. He's a very memorable guy. That guy that did your social music shit? Yeah, Bobby. Bobby. How do we know he's offended by those guys? He flips his shit. He does, but in a very particular way. Does he gets... He's like embarrassed? Ugh. You went after him, didn't you? With a Stay giant up. iron file. He's going to beat those guys to death. Somebody stops him. It would be, be, be a very different poll. But we could easily say that he is offended by those guys taking their clothes off. Fair to say, right, given his reaction? Okay. A slightly less inflammatory moment in the poem involves the speaker's father also being offended. Do you guys recall this? Who offends the speaker's father? It's early in the poem. It's a character who comes up a couple times. It's not Bobby. Bobby's got his own thing going on. It's this guy. He's from California. Is it the uncle? Uncle Ross. He tap dances and he's from California. And the way the poll presents that information is that that's basically two strikes against him. Those two things. Like, oh my God, what's wrong with you? Tap dancing and being from California. But he does a thing. He says a thing in the poem that offends the father so much he has to get up and leave the room. Does anyone recall what he does? Or... He calls the mother centerpiece lovely, which is a synonym for beauty. So he talks about beauty. And the father, uh, in that moment in the poem, leaves the room. Now, the thought exercise I had you guys do at the time, I said, and don't say it out loud, but I said, think of a word right now that if, like I said it, you would get up and leave. There's only a few, but that, that, that's a very strong word, whatever that word is, right? And it, it varies from person to person, background to background. Don't say it out loud. But in that poll, the word lovely has the same power over the speaker's father, right? I only make that point to stress to you, like, that's a very important sort of rule that gets broken for the speaker's father, okay? Now, to bring it back to what we're talking about here, we're talking about being offended. This German surgeon, he's been at work all day, we learned some other things about him, he is so offended by Billy's appearance that he has to go up to him and basically say, hey, motherfucker, like that. He walks up to him, gets in his face. Again, I don't know how I would have to dress. I don't know that I could. I would have to do something to you to offend you so much, you not knowing me at all. In a public place, you would walk up to me and kind of give me your thoughts about it, right? That is, that is strong. So I ask, why? Why is this German surgeon so offended by Billy's appearance? He hasn't even said anything. He probably wouldn't like what Billy has to say, but just how he's dressed affects the surgeon so much he has to go up and say something to him. Why do you think? Yeah? Maybe the surgeon feels like um, he's <coughs> trying to be funny because of the like, bracket. Well, when he says, he says, um, the surgeon, I take it you find war a very comical thing. Why would that be a problem? Because he, so he thinks Billy has dressed this way on purpose, right? He, he somehow thinks all this is funny. Why does that bother the surgeon? Trying to save people's lives and like, they're going to death. Well, by the way, Billy's dress doesn't necessarily have much to do with the, the surgeon's line of work, right? Billy's not a surgeon. I don't think anyone would confuse him with a surgeon. What else? 
What you're getting at, though, is a good line of thought. You're basically saying, I think it was you. It's hard with the masks. But I believe it was you. Damn, it's real hard with the masks. Um, you're basically kind of getting at this idea that they, that maybe they share something or, or that Billy, the way that he stresses is commenting about something for this German surgeon, right? And that's a fair way to think about it. If you think about when people get offended, we're not talking about if it's right or wrong, not doing that. Even if it's wrong in some situation, when people get offended, it seems to be whatever is done or said in their presence comments upon something about that person, right? So then for this German surgeon, something about the way Billy is dressed. Oh, you think this is funny, motherfucker? He basically says, right? The German surgeon is, is taking that as a comment on him. How, though, do you think? Because he says, <clears throat> again, and it can help to look back at the, the paragraph we read, but it says the sight of Billy offended him. So just seeing him offends him. And then, especially after he learned that Billy was American. So especially after he learns that Billy is an American POW, it offends him even more. Why? Why can't that guy just look like an idiot, right? What's that got to do with this German surgeon? Why does that, why does that sort of offend, or, or why does he take offense to like who he is as a person, do you think? Somebody get a car right now? What do you mean by that? I don't know, I guess the way that they're being brought up. Okay. Not defensive. <coughs> he is in Germany, early 20th century. I don't know a lot about that. I, I didn't grow up that way, you know. But there are some stereotypes we have, right? Early 20th century Germans sit up straight, um, have a very particular, they, they all probably have like, tightly folded clothes. We, have, we envision them as very military already, like, like very like proper or whatever, stereotypically. That's interesting. I think it does have something to do with the, the German's background for sure. What else do we know about him? We know he's a surgeon, what else do we know about him? Maybe he was operating on it, so he was probably exhausted. Probably had a, and again, this isn't just a guy at a hospital, that's its own hell, sure. Who's he operating on, probably? Soldiers. Probably. This is Germany, toward the end of World War II. What's that, man? Yeah, he's seeing some crazy shit, right? As a German surgeon in World War II? I couldn't even imagine. Yeah, that's part of it. What else about his background? We learned a couple more things. Go look at that paragraph real quick. We learned some important thing. We're on page uh, he served in two wars. 193. What's two wars? What kind of wars? World wars. World wars. How many of those have we had? Two. Two. So he fought yeah. in both world wars including the one that we are still in. You see what I'm saying? So, at best, he's like a year or two removed from fighting, you know, something like that. So he's not just a German surgeon, he's a German... Veteran. Soldier. Veteran, if you like, yeah. And so now he and Billy share something. They're both soldiers. Yes, they're on opposite sides, but they're both soldiers. So now, again, we have a little better background, right? Why does the way Billy is dressed offend him, do you think? Billy looks like a fool. Why does the German care? He says, you think this is funny, don't you? Why, do you think? If, I'll put it to you this way. He thinks Billy is having a laugh. He thinks Billy is like addressing that way as a joke, right? Why does that offend him? If you think somebody is making a joke and it offends you, how does that work? Why is that? We have language for that. They're both soldiers. They're in Germany toward the end of World War II. This is a very high stakes situation, right? Everybody's probably on edge. 
And Billy's dressed like an idiot. And this guy thinks Billy did it on purpose. Maybe he thinks he's poking fun at like all the people in his past who were on the Okay. Sure. Well, two things. So number one, yes, yeah, poking fun, like mocking, right, is what we're talking about. He, um, and either one works, right? I'm just using, using my word, but yeah, in some ways, this German surgeon sees Billy is like you're just you're making a mockery of all this. Like we're in Germany in World War II, bro. Could you show a little more respect? Is what he's saying, right? And then the question becomes, well, respect for what? That's kind of a wide open door. One thing that's interesting, respect for the dead. Sure, millions of people on both sides have died at this point in the war. And many more will die after this point. But isn't it interesting to see a guy on the street and say, hey man, why do you hate these dead people so much? Like, isn't that basically what we're doing? Or what the German surgeon is doing? Isn't that in and of itself crazy? Like Billy's not wearing a sign that says, fuck the dead people. Like there's no, there's no specific thing. But something about, something about the way the German surgeon approaches Billy here does have that idea that like if you're not, like you can appear wrongly, okay? Which supposes you can appear rightly. And if you don't adhere to that right thing, whatever it is, how you're supposed to look and act, well, then you must be sort of against all the ideas that go along with it, right? If you're not serious in the way that we're talking about, if you're not showing reverence in that way, you must hate the dead people, right? What else might Billy be mocking for this German surgeon, do you think? I think we have a menu. Um, Why else, in other words, might the German surgeon be very serious right now? Um, Ugh, or I think Billy should be. What does he know about Billy's situation? He knows he's American. So what? What does the German surgeon immediately know about Billy when he finds out he's American? Where he's going? What do you mean by that? Like, just how he's being transported to the slaughter we may not know that specifically, but he knows he's a prisoner of war, right? In Nazi Germany. I would imagine if we were in Billy's position, most of us would be a little more uh, serious. Definitely wouldn't be cracking many jokes, right? You mean I'm where? Oh no, not a lot of funny stuff, right? And so this, this surgeon then has an idea about the situation, the world they're in, the time they're in, Billy's place in it. He hasn't, Billy hasn't spoken a word to him, but he assumes all these things that Billy should be, you follow? And when Billy does not adhere to those expectations, the surgeon takes great offense. He has to walk up to him and call him on it, right? Because he's not adhering to those expectations. Now, of course, we know Billy does not dress himself. He doesn't do anything for himself in this book. He's given those clothes. He just kind of walks his way through the whole book and is just like given different things, told to do different things. And that's its own issue, right? That big question of fate that we raised last week. But to the German surgeon, he sees Billy and imagines he's not taking this seriously enough. And he's an enemy too. Even given that, he... he now that we kind of got that out of the open, why does the German surgeon care that Billy doesn't take it seriously? German surgeon seems to take it plenty seriously. And in some ways, shouldn't all of us just be worried about what we think, right? Here in 2020? That's very tongue in cheek, by the way. I'm trying to help you guys out. Do we care when people don't take certain things seriously enough? Are we bothered? Are we offended, perhaps? That's an honest question. I was hoping you guys would have an answer for it. I'll put it to you this way. We learn not just that the surgeon <clears throat> takes certain things seriously, especially given his day and his background, what we learn about him, 
very few details, it makes all the sense in the world for him to be a pretty serious guy, right? We get that. And you could even, to a, to a point, understand why he would find Billy's appearance upsetting, okay? But again, it's that being offended, so offended, he's going to walk up to him and, and talk to him about it, yell at him about it. That's why I took it all the way back to the speaker's father of beauty, getting so offended by Uncle Ross saying lovely, he gets up and leaves the room. Like it makes him act. It compels you to do a thing, to feel that strongly about something. It says that it means a whole lot to you. So again, think back to that thought exercise if it helps. If I were to walk in and say that word, don't say it, but if I were to walk in and say that word that would hit you so deeply that you'd be like, fuck this guy, you'd get up and leave, right? That's what we're talking about here. It's on that same level. So why, why is that offensive? I'm not saying it shouldn't be. What I'm saying is, like, I'm trying to get us to talk about how that works. Because I think it's happening to the surgeon here, too. Why is he so offended by the way Billy looks? Why does he care? Why would you care if I said whatever word you thought of in that thought exercise, right? Why, do you, why? why does it bother you that much? Why do you care? Why do you care what I think or say, right? Why? Sure. Well, that's kind of on the same line you were talking about. Like, it's, it's personal in some way. Now, again, I'm going to keep drawing this through line for you. So that tells us, and I think, I think this is true, I think the surgeon takes Billy's appearance personally. Like, it affects him on a personal level, the fact that Billy is dressed like an idiot. That's interesting. Did you have more to say about that, by the way? Uh, no. Just that. <laughs> What's personal about it? I'm gonna, I'm gonna play like an idiot for a second. The surgeon is. Well, you can, well, we can talk about the surgeon, or we can talk about the words we will not say. But a word, if I walked in as a white man in 2020 and said this word to any of you, and it's different for different people, different backgrounds, but if I said this word to you, you'd be like, that guy's a piece of shit, and you would get up and leave, right? We all have a couple words at least. I kind of don't, because again, white man 2020, but that's not the point. The point is, it is personal but I think we can talk about it a little bit more to help figure out the surgeon. What is it to be that offended that you get up and leave? It affects you personally, but why? Why? Maybe because he sees it as like something that's disrespectful. Of what? Especially if we're talking about it like on a personal level. Like the war. Maybe? Sure, and that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Disrespecting, and it, this is World War fucking two. We're in Nazi Germany. It is a very serious situation. But isn't it weird to think that that situation is owed respect? I'm not saying it's not, but like, we're talking about it. Like, you're in Nazi Germany, into World War II. Show some more respect, man. Take this shit seriously. That's strange. I think it's fair. I think we would all kind of see what the guy's talking about, but it's weird. Now, take that for a second. We're going to put that on a shelf, because I think that's involved. I still want to get at this idea it doesn't just offend the surgeon who are thinking about the war. It offends him on a personal level. Again, if you want, have a thought exercise. If I walked, whatever way I could walk in dressed a certain way, there's a few probably, but if I was dressed in such a way that you'd be so offended, you'd have to call me out on it, right? Like, hey man, what the fuck? Is basically what the surgeon is doing here. Why? Why is it so, like how does that offense work? Because it is personal. But, but how? How does it affect you personally? That offensive thing, whatever it is. Are we supposed to keep wearing like old military uniforms? No, 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 no. It's an impresario. It's like an, uh, it's a performer. It's pretty feminine. Okay. And again, it's way too small. So it, already, it looks like kids clothing and it's, it's got like fur collars and stuff. Yes, ma'am. I can't quite hear you, I'm sorry. Do you think of surgeons displacing the Afghans and Well, he is, but he's, he's more offended because, like, he doesn't take offense at the other Americans with him, right? Because they look the part. They look like POWs, you know. 
It's just him. He's not taken seriously enough. It has something to do with the war. But all I'm saying is, and again, we can talk about the surgeon if you want, if that helps you. Or if you think about your own situation, whatever I could do or say that it would offend you so much, you'd leave or you'd call me out. Like, how does that have, this affects the surgeon personally. Yes, ma'am. So it'd be like a respect thing? Like, so we're disrespecting, well, what are we disrespecting? The war image, like, yeah, like and soldiers? But how does that affect the surgeon personally? So, let, I mean, again, we're going to put that on a shelf. We can get back to that. And again, we can talk about the surgeon or we can talk about you guys. If I were to do or say that thing, if it offends you so much, you would have to leave or you would have to call me on it, right? How does that affect you personally? How does that work? I think we can talk about that. I mean, hell, we're talking about World War II. If I came in dressed like a Nazi, had the stupid Hitler mustache, all that goofy shit, right? Some people would easily find that offensive. And with good reason. Probably personally. But why? How, how does that affect you personally? Personal loss, maybe? Like if you knew somebody specifically or whatever? I guess so. Like if you were Jewish and somebody I mean, sure. Like but even if you're not. You don't have to be Jewish to be offended by somebody doing Nazi shit, right? Like that, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, level. absolutely. But I'm saying it can it can go it can extend further than that too, though. Is all I'm saying. How does that work? Because this German surgeon does not know Billy, never met him before, won't see him after this. But in this moment, he's not dressed right. If I were to walk in dressed as a Nazi, I would not be dressed right, right? And it would be personally offensive to, I'm going to say, everybody in the room. But why? Like, for you, I'm just asking for you. Anybody, like, for you, why would that, how would that affect you personally? I would find it offensive if somebody walked in like that. And I can tell you why, but I'm trying to get it from you. Why is that personally offensive? Somebody to walk in like that. Yeah, but why is that personally offensive to you? <laughs> Say I do it as a joke. And it would be, by the way, a bad joke, but if I ever, like, I'm not, I'm not into that shit. But even if I told you guys I was joking, I think we would all rightfully say, uh-huh, not good enough, bro, not a good idea. Why? Why, why is it perfectly fine to be personally offended if I show up like that, even if I say I'm joking? So the ideas that it espouses, and again, that's different from the ideas of Billy, right? That we're saying those are two different things. But the ideas somehow offend us personally. Now the question is, why? Why? This is a different question to each one of you, because each one of you is a different person from different backgrounds. But I think it can, it can get to the same idea. Like, why is it personally offensive? Sure. Uh-huh. Okay. Why? Because I'm having real trouble hearing you. I'm very sorry. Being hated by someone because of the color that I look. Okay. As a black woman. Yeah. Okay. Now, again, you have a personal reason for being offended by that, but... The idea that that mode of dress represents is a general one, right? That you can take personally, given your background and what have you, right? Same thing for the German surgeon. That's the only point I'm making. Billy is dressed in a way that disrespects the war. And we talked about that. And that's the general sort of interpretation of his mode of dress. And I think that's accurate. He doesn't seem to be taking it seriously. We know that's not his fault. This German guy doesn't. But the way the German surgeon takes it, he's fought both world wars. He's been operating on people all day. He's in Germany. Not a good place to be toward the end of World War II. And he sees this guy not taking it seriously. All the things we know about the German surgeon, he's like, dude, you don't know like the life I've had and like lived through and the stuff I've seen? Fuck you. Like, 
He takes it personally because it doesn't just disrespect the war, and that's important, but it disrespects like all the attachments that the surgeon has to the war. Like basically what we're saying is to respect the war, to look how you're supposed to, that's not just important to the surgeon. That's like personal to him. You see what I'm saying? That's part of his worldview in the same way that I think all of us would agree. And if you don't, you probably don't say it out loud, but all of us would agree there are certain ways you should not dress and certain things you probably shouldn't do, right? Just very generally. I gave you the, the example of me coming in dressed like that, okay? Probably shouldn't do that for the reasons that you pointed out, both generally and personally. But what that says is that general interpretation of that mode of dress applies to all of us personally, and in your case, it offends you personally because your worldview, basically that it's the idea of hate, as you said, um, is very significant to your worldview. It defines you in a way. I'm not saying that hate defines you, but sort of the, the being against it, right? Like, like recognizing it and what have you. That we're saying the same sort of thing for the German surgeon when it comes to respect, respecting the war, respecting the people in it, all that gets wrapped up in that, right? We learn all of that about this German surgeon in this paragraph, as short as it is. That's the point I'm making. In this brief exchange he has with Billy, that's what we learn about him, that he defines himself according to that stuff. And when somebody mocks it, even though he's not trying to, pisses him off. Moving on. I just want to make that point. There's points like that all through the book, man, that are very powerful. There's a lot going on. And I worry sometimes you guys just kind of, like, steamroll past it, you know? Okay. There's at least one other thing I want to talk about. If we have time to do other things, we will. But we do have to talk about Jarvis at some point, too. All right. That was kind of a, a not nice thing we talked about. So I like to, to flip the script a little bit. We're talking about a nice thing. Okay, here on page 202, and if you're in an e-copy of the book, the paragraph begins, uh, there those girls were. Okay, you can search for that, and then I'll get you to the, the paragraph. The context here, it's a little later. Uh, Billy is still a POW. He's in, Dre he's in Dresden now. They've been there for a little while. It's Billy and a young boy, German soldier, I think he says he's like 15 or something, so he's a boy, and Derby, and they get lost. They're in Dresden, they don't know where they are. They're supposed to go get food for the other POWs, and they get lost. And on the way to trying to find their way back, this happens. Well, I get a little more context. They stumble upon uh, some young women in the shower, okay? There those girls were with all their private parts bare for anybody to see. And there in the doorway were Gluck and Derby and Pilgrim, the childish soldier and the poor old high school teacher and the clown in his toga and silver shoes, staring. The girls screamed. They covered themselves with their hands and turned their backs and so on and made themselves utterly beautiful. So there's a couple of interesting things going on there. The thing I want to talk about, just to put it out there, the narrator calls those, those girls, those young women, beautiful, which is interesting. But I'll put it to you guys. Do you guys notice anything else going on in the paragraph? Anything strike you as, as interesting or, or odd or noteworthy? We would talk about, we're going to talk about beauty, but I want to see if there's anything else you want to talk about first. <laughs> Which, which people? The childish soldier and the poor high school teacher and the clown in his toga and silver shoes. Okay. Yeah. What about that? I mean, I, I agree, actually, but... That's obvious. It is. <laughs> well, it's because he has said all these things uh, probably multiple times, actually, but he kind of reminds us here that Gluck is a boy, Derby is really too old to be a soldier, he's really just a high school teacher, and Pilgrim still looks like an idiot. And they're just there staring at these women in the shower. 
Why do that, do you think? Why point out these things about these three uh, sort of, I guess you could say men? Why point out what these three men sort of look like or what these three men sort of are when they stumble across these women in the shower? Like, what's your opinion of these men, given that description? The childish soldier, the poor old high school teacher, and the clown in his toga and silver shoes. What does that make you think about these three guys? That they're childish. They're, you take them less seriously, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. The most, the most manly among them is a poor old high school teacher. Like, he's kind of, you know, think about one of your poor old high school teachers. Not maybe the most manly in that stereotypical way. Okay. Well, why does that matter here? Again, what's going on in this scene? They're staring at them while they're in the shower. Yeah. Well, they stumble across them, right? And they open the door and they're like, oh. Right? And there's a couple ways to read a scene like that. Right? Now, let's get our party straight. We have three guys who show up, <clears throat> and we've talked about them a little bit. How do we talk about uh, these young women? What are some descriptions we get? Beautiful. Well, at the end, and we'll talk about that at the end, but we gotta do some work first. What else do we say about them? That they cover themselves and hide their backs. Much earlier than that. Again, we'll, we will talk about that. How do we talk about the girls before we talk about what they do? They were butt naked. That's not what we say. Language is important. If we say those women were butt naked, we would read this scene a different way. Okay? How do we talk about it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. Their private parts bare to anybody. Their private parts? Does anybody say that? I know we don't talk about it all the time, probably. But if you ever do, does private parts come to mind? No. That's what my five year old calls them, that's what children call them, right? The point I'm making is, again, there's a couple ways we could depict this scene, but it's depicted, it's desexualized. From the very first sentence, we're talking about private parts. We call them girls, not women. Um, but again, the narrator's an older man. He's just, they're younger women is what he's saying. But they're girls with private parts. The three men who stumble across them aren't, they're not like, ugh, you know, they're just kind of, One's a child, one's an idiot, one's a high school teacher. They're not, they didn't, they weren't, they weren't looking for this. They didn't like, let's go find them. They're just like, oh. And that's important. It's a different kind of scene that might happen in a different kind of story, right? In a different kind of story, this would be written a different way. And that's important. Now, all that said, that's our context again. We do say they're beautiful. But why? This is important. That last sentence, they made themselves utterly beautiful. How do they make themselves utterly beautiful? So we don't say they're beautiful outright. They make themselves that way. What do they do? They turn their backs. They turn their backs and they cover themselves with their hand. As anyone would do, by the way. Somebody busted you on the shower, isn't everyone's response, oh, Jesus Christ, right? Like immediately. Okay. Why? Why do we do that? Were they maintaining their modesty? That's a very taciturn way to put that. Uh, what do you mean by that? Um, Not disagreeing, by the way. Just... Since they're kind of desexualizing this whole paragraph, yeah, they were talking about them covering themselves with their hands, stuff like that. Like in a different book, they probably would have talked about it in a different way. They could have easily not... been sexualized. Yeah, and they sure. did. They chose not to. Well, the narrator chose not to. Yes. <coughs> but what's that got to do with them being uh, utterly beautiful, these girls? Normally, and look, I'm talking to a class full of women. I don't have to tell you, especially in America, but around the world. If a woman's in a book or a movie and she's naked, she's going to be sexualized. Like, that's how that works. I, I, I assume I'm not, like, breaking news to you here. Like, Yeah. But 
the narrator makes the point early that we're not doing that here, which is interesting. But also what's interesting is a lot of the time when we talk about a beautiful woman, it's in sexual terms. And again, we're not doing that here. You say maintaining their modesty, and there's, that's actually a loaded phrase. You may not be aware of that, and that's okay. But I think it's more fundamental than that. Because again, real talk, I am not a woman, as it turns out. But if someone busted in on the shower and I was in it, I would react the same way. I would, I would scream. My kids do it occasionally. Little kids are fun. But it, get out! What's wrong with you? Right? Actually, if the three-year-old does it, it's just funny because he, he'll pull back the curtain and it's about this high, right? So he's like, what are you doing? He'll say that. And we're like, hey, man, you're really cute. But this is not, I don't like this. Can you go? Um, so you still try to get rid of him. So why? Man or woman. It doesn't make a difference. Like, why? Why do you scream? Why do you cover? Why? I know it's a stupid question. Why? Why does it make you uncomfortable? Because you're naked. Okay. Because you're vulnerable. Good. And I was going to come to that, but like, think of it this way. There's no reason you would be, but if you're naked in the park and somebody came across you, you would still probably react in a similar way. But you're there naked, but you know somebody's probably going to see you. Yeah, it's a public place. And if you didn't expect to be seen, well, that's on you. <laughs> but you're in the shower. Look, we have what's called a hotel lock on the front door. It's, it's like a huge thing. You swing over the door. You cannot, even if you have a key, you cannot get in the house. When I get in the shower, if I'm home alone, that hotel lock's going on. Right? Because I feel vulnerable. Right? You're defenseless. You are naked, but you're also in the shower. Like, it's a very private space. It's a very intimate space. You let your guard down, right? In all those ways. And if someone intrudes on that, even if it's not a sexual thing, right? If someone intrudes on that, you feel like violated almost. You know what I'm saying? Anyone would feel that way. And so these girls, as the narrator calls them, cover up, they turn their backs, they try to protect themselves, right? When you try to protect yourself, though, aren't you also announcing your vulnerability when you do that? To have to protect yourself at all kind of supposes that you're vulnerable. So what I'm saying is, when he says they make themselves beautiful by covering up, what's he pointing to? What's beautiful about these girls? It's not the way we normally talk about women. What's beautiful here about these girls? They're vulnerable. Yeah. The fact that they're vulnerable, that they're trying to protect themselves, he says is utterly beautiful. Isn't that a wild way to talk about beauty? To be vulnerable is beautiful to the narrator, he says. Because we talked about beauty a little bit when we talked about that poem, but we, we had a lot of other stuff to do. We didn't have time to talk about it. In that poem, and I also think in this book, it's like beauty is fragile. Think about all the things you think are beautiful. You're going to have a couple things at the top, and maybe those are actually beautiful. But a lot of times, it's just ridiculous shit you're sold. It's like Beyonce or whatever. All right, okay, fine. But like real, like fundamental beauty, like the things we consider beautiful, you're talking about like sunsets or the first time your child smiles at you. I don't know if you know this, it takes them like four to six months to learn to smile. So it's like real work those first couple months. They just poop and eat and cry. And you're like, can you give me anything? And then the first day they smile, and like it hits you here, like it's deep. Because it's fragile. It's a small thing that's gonna disappear very quickly. It's vulnerable, right? But that, the fact that it's vulnerable, it's fragile, I think the narrator and also the speaker in that poem, they're kind of saying that's a big part of us appreciating the beauty in it. That's part of the definition. It might be the definition. I just want to make that point to you. Beauty doesn't come up a lot in this book. A lot of this book is not beautiful, right? But it comes up in moments. There's a syrup scene where uh, Billy gives a spoon to Derby and he cries, right? Because he just had to have food. Like that's a beautiful moment because it's quick and he kind of shows, Derby shows that he's vulnerable, right? Which is a hard thing for a guy like that to probably do. That's what makes it beautiful, I think, according to the narrator. 
So when we talk about in, the, in the, some of the poems, like what are these guys missing or what are these guys giving up by not even admitting when something is beautiful, like not allowing themselves to admit it, I think it's that. They're missing moments like that. And it kind of makes sense when we think about stereotypical man stuff, right? You can't be vulnerable. You can't be fragile. We get that. We know that narrative. Well, if that's true, then you also don't get to have beauty. It's worth thinking about. Okay. All right. I have other things to talk about. We do not have time because we got to shift gears. But I will talk about them on Wednesday. I know you won't be here. But I'll film it. You can watch. It'd be a good time. Popcorn. Anyway, okay. What we're going to do now, as I promised with the last little bit of class, uh, 20, 30 minutes, I want to talk about Christina Jarvis. So if you could, please pull this up on course 10. This should be, I believe, in our current week that we're in. I don't know what number that is because I'm not good with numbers. That's why I teach English. But if anybody could help everybody else out, that would be appreciated. Week eight. Week eight. Thank you. And she's there, right? Jarvis? Sweet. Open that up if you would. The Vietnamization of World War II. Yes. Very intense title. <laughs> Alright, so all we're going to do today, we're going to talk about her introduction. Because, I guess really starting next week, you guys are going to start doing some, some scholarly research, Okay. And what that means is you're going to be reading all kinds of articles. And some of them are going to freak you guys right the hell out. They're going to speak in a way you're not used to speaking. You're going to zone out when you're reading it, which I totally understand. And you're going to not understand anything. And you're going to be like, how am I going to do this assignment? The point I'm going to make to you today with Jarvis is two things. One, for the most part, all papers are built in around about the same way. What I mean by that is... They're built in the same way I teach you to write papers. More on that in a second. Number two, given that, you can, for the most part anyway, understand these things. So it's important not to freak out. It's important not to think, all hope is lost, I have no shot. You can do this. It's not as hard as you might think initially. Okay. Now, Jarvis, we're looking at it. I just want to talk to you about the first two pages. You'll notice if you go to the second page, we have a section header. It says, Slaughterhouse-Five, A New Kind of War Story. It's bolded. You guys see that? <clears throat> her introduction to this paper, this is a 30-page paper, her introduction is everything before that section header. Okay? Now, you look at that and you're like, that's kind of a long intro. Well, it's kind of a long paper, right? If you're writing three, four, five-page papers, whatever, your intro is going to be shorter than that. With that in mind, I just want to read those first couple paragraphs before that section header, and we're going to talk about it the same way we talk about introductions. Okay? We can do this. To begin with, very first page, you have one paragraph. It's kind of long. It's going to go on to the second page. I want you to read over that, and we're going to talk about what that paragraph accomplishes. Like, why is it in this paper? Right? So take a minute, read over that. We'll talk about it as a class. All right. So what, what is this paragraph doing? Do we learn anything in this first paragraph? It talks about how to use, about Nixon as a plan to withdraw troops from Vietnam yeah. while still continuing the progress of progress. Yeah, and that's uh, Vietnamization, that word, sort of is that program. It's this idea like, look, we're going to leave, because presidents before Nixon have been promising we're going to leave Vietnam. But before we do that, we're going to train these guys up, the South Vietnamese forces, so they can fight better for themselves. Blah, blah. That's the idea. Vietnamization. Yeah. <clears throat> what else do we learn? A couple interesting uh, sort of tidbits here in this paragraph. And if you don't like that question, you can also just skip to the end and say, what is this paragraph here for? What does it give us? Why is it in the paper at all? Do you think? Because apparently we were supposed to be talking about Slaughterhouse-Five, right? What is all this? This isn't about Slaughterhouse-Five. Does it 
tie in in any sort of way you could suss out? Do you see any parallels? What's Slaughterhouse Five about? Not a lot of cattle in the book, right? What's Slaughterhouse Five about? Just some stuff. You don't have to give me a, a, a plot summary. Like, what's some stuff this book is about? The war. war, particularly World War II, but generally, war. Yeah. Okay. Does it have anything to do with this first paragraph? Yeah. Vietnam's a different war. Nixon and kind of his approach to it. Okay. Anything else having to do with, with that idea? Nixon or war? Does anything Nixon says or does maybe strike you as potentially interesting? Well, he promises that like he won't send American boys to fight. Yeah. That he does, but presidents before him did that too. Yeah. It was weird how he kept ordering the movie Patton. Patton. Refused it. Multiple times. Now I'm assuming none of you have seen that movie. Am I correct in that assumption? Okay. I've not seen it either. <clears throat> it's like three and a half, four hours long. It's a long movie. Does anybody know what it is? That's fine too. It is an old school war movie. Okay. Based on a general from World War II. And that should tell you uh, a, a little bit about the kind of movie it is. But basically, Patton, before the movie came out, and then definitely after, was seen as this, like, tough as nails. He doesn't disregard orders. I mean, he's a general. But he, he also, he's going to get in there. He's going to, like, kind of do what he wants if the situation calls for it, right? He's a man's man, blah, 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 all that stuff. And the movie is very much that way. If you've ever seen, especially an old war movie, you kind of know how this movie goes. And Nixon watches it several times in a week, which is kind of interesting. Seems like that was on his mind, he right? He be preoccupied and he wouldn't have time for movies, so he may have planned something like this. Well, it's, to me, the way, the way it seems like uh, Jarvis is thinking about it is like that must color his thinking. Like however he's thinking about Vietnam, he's thinking about it kind of in the back of the head, you know. Like getting ideas from it? Yeah, 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 yeah. And so, I mean, she says, like, maybe it's his inspiration, blah, blah, blah. She kind of starts to make that point. Why do we get all this, though, do you think? What is this? Most of this first paragraph is that stuff. What kind of information is that? Do we have language for that? I think we do. Context. Context. What kind of context? Um, kind of explaining some of what she's going to talk about. Yes, yes, but particularly, we were talking about Nixon and Vietnam and Patton. What kind of context is that? Anybody know? We have a word for it. So it's not happening now. It's not happening when she wrote the paper. It's historical context. What does context mean? I was hoping you knew. Could you use the word? You don't know? Um, isn't this just insight in what she's doing? No. Context is what's happening around a thing. Okay? So, for instance, if I, I'm going to keep using the example, if I came into class dressed as a literal clown, like the stupid hair, the nose, all that stuff, you would justifiably have questions. Given the context, we are in a classroom. I'm not dressed correctly, given the context. If, however, I was dressed as a clown and we were at a circus, you might still have questions. You'd be like, wait, isn't that my teeth? But at the same time, you're like, I guess he has a second job. It's a gig economy. The context makes sense. Context is what goes on around a text or around a thing, okay? This is historical context. Nixon, Vietnam, all that stuff. This book was published in 1969. Vietnam was still going on when this book was written and published. Okay, So that's historical context. Like That's the world Vonnegut was in when he was doing this. 
if we're going to write an introduction, I told you this whole first section is her introduction, historical context like that, we haven't even talked about Slaughterhouse-Five yet, when do you do that in an introduction? Like, offer some kind of, maybe it's historical context. I'm not saying it necessarily interests you, but if you're the sort of person to go looking for articles like me, maybe you're a bit of a nerd, maybe you're like, oh, we're talking about Nixon in Vietnam, we push up my glasses, this is cool. What, what part of an introduction is that, do you think? There's only four parts. You guys love this part. You always have them. The one part of the, the intro you guys always have, you can't tell me. Yeah. You know, look at you. You had it in your heart the whole time. Yeah. Trying to hook the reader with some interesting historical context, you know? Yeah, we're going to talk about Slaughterhouse-Five, given that title. But before that, let me tell you a little about Nixon, Vietnam. He had a weird thing for this one movie. We'll tell you that first, right? And then we're going to kind of get into talking about the book. Yeah. This is the hook. It's a long hook. That's a long paper. The very end of the paragraph, though, we kind of shift gears. What are, what are we talking about the last, oh, I don't know. Really, it's all on the second page. All that stuff on the second page, the end of this uh, first paragraph. What are we talking about there? We're not really talking about Nixon or, or Patton. Uh, so much anymore. We say something about Nixon. Nixon was haunted. Haunted by what? The specter of World War II. What's a specter? It's a fancy word for a ghost. He's haunted by the ghost of World War II, a war that offered Americans a clear cut, decisive victory, positioned the U.S. as a superpower in contrast to the bad war, which is Vietnam. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you real quick. World War II is a good war for America. And she gives you a couple reasons. And she talks about this one later, but this is my favorite. What's a good war if you're America? She says World War II is a good war. Well, it helped our economy out a lot. That's the superpower business, yes. Europe was, uh, to borrow a phrase from a comedian I enjoyed, financially fucked by the end of World War II. England and Germany and all these other powers were just, because that's where the fighting happened, screwed. America, we lost a lot of lives and all this, but like, nobody fought over here, so we were like, well, we came out okay. Yeah, aside from that, there's some other questions that come up in war. Good war, that to me says we're the good guys, right? How do you know we're the good guys in World War II? How do you know, like you know we're the good guys in World War II? Who do we fight? That has something to do with it, right? We fought Germany. Yeah, we fought Germany. We fought the Allied nuclear powers. Yeah. Axis powers. But primarily, especially if we're talking about this book, we're talking about Germany. We're really called German during World War II. Who are the Germans in World War II? We have a very loaded word for Germans in World War II. British? Nazis? Those people are from England. Oh. Um, <laughs> Nazis! We're talking about fucking Nazis, guys. You know when you're the good guy? When you're fighting fucking Nazis. That means you're the good guy. Yeah, we dropped some bombs on Japan, there's questions about it, but we also fought fucking Nazis. So look guys, we're on the right side here. It's clear cut, isn't it? Pretty easy. If you want somebody to know that they're the, that's why part, partially why I used that example earlier. You want somebody to know they're the villain in a movie, TV show, video game, I don't care. Dress them like a Nazi, immediately. You don't, they don't have to say anything, have to do anything. You're like, that's the bad guy. Because he's dressed like a fucking murderer. Right? We know that, immediately. So it's a good war. World War II, we fought the Nazis. We can be, as a country, we can feel good about that. And we often do. Right? So she says that we're going to talk about that. That Nixon is haunted by that idea somehow. 
And then Vietnam, which by the way, you guys don't talk about it in school a lot because it's like toward the end of history, right? That was the first war that was televised. People would go home at night. They would be on the news. And they're fighting the enemy, but they're also, you know, they might blow up the occasional village or like burn people alive accidentally. And it's like women and children sometimes. And like, when you have Nazi and you have like women and children that look like they're just like farming maybe, it's kind of hard to, it's harder to feel like the good guy when it's like that. You know what I'm saying? We don't feel as good as a, as a country when we see it on TV. Like, wait, what are we doing exactly? So that's seen as a bad war, okay? And when we introduce the text here, which is what we're doing, we're saying that Nixon first has to deal with these two ideas. World War II, good war. Vietnam, which is what's going on when this book is written, when Nixon is in office. Bad war, and he's trying to square the two. That's our text somehow. That means the next two paragraphs that we have here are what two parts of the introduction? Oh my. One of them is the thesis, you would hope. Good. Does anybody remember the other one? It's a roadmap. That's where you help me understand some of the finer points of the thesis, some of the finer points of the paper. <coughs> I don't know how I'm going to make it through today. All right. Read over that next paragraph. It's not as long. We're going to talk about it. All right. So there's a lot of words here. And a lot of it stems from the fact that we also have to introduce our two primary texts. Slaughterhouse-Five and a book we will not be talking about, Gravity's Rainbow. Which, by the way, if you think Slaughterhouse-Five is, is wild and maybe sometimes kind of hard to follow, you should try Gravity's Rainbow. Holy cow. But... All that stuff out of the way, because she has to do that, right? She has to make sure we know we're talking about those books. She makes some arguments here. She makes some claims, some things she would have to prove or speak to. If you guys pick those out for us. Vietnam was favoring representations in World War II. Okay, so she's saying, given these two books, this one and one we're not going to talk about, somehow Vietnam, which was going on when those books are written and published, is shaping stories about World War II, this is a story about World War II. And piggybacking off of that, she says another thing. And it sounds super fancy, but we're going to break it down. She uses a verb you guys have never used in your lives. It starts with a D. Toward the end. Deconstructed? Deconstructed? You're breaking my heart right now. Yeah, these books, according to Jarvis, deconstructed the binary framing of America's good war and bad war. Binary just means like a yes-no proposition. You're either heads or tails, you're either uh, male or female, it's either a good war or a bad war. That's binary. Her point here is that these books are basically saying, all right, look, you know Patton, you know those movies? They say World War II was awesome on this side. <clears throat> and you know when you go home and you watch the news and you're like, Vietnam seems pretty bad in a lot of ways. By the way, we lose that war. That's another reason it's a bad war for us. She's saying that these books are saying those are closer to each other than you realize. Vietnam's not all good. Yes, fighting Nazis is probably a good thing. There's other stuff going on too. It's not all Nazis. It's not that clear cut. It's closer to the middle, probably. It's a little darker. This is her roadmap. These are her detailed ideas. Which means that final paragraph is what? Her thesis. Thesis. My goodness. Do your best. Read over this last paragraph. We're going to talk about it with the last couple minutes we have. All right. Now, I know this is a, a pretty thick thesis. If you feel like your head is swimming a little bit, trying to follow all of it, that's quite all right. All right. The point I want to make to you is, number one, she does not have a super detailed roadmap. She does have one in that above paragraph, but I think she can explain these ideas a little uh, better before we get to the thesis. 
not everybody's going to do that. She doesn't do that here. But if you can, and I think we all can, if you can trim away some of the stuff she hasn't explained yet, and also just some of the stuff that like, you're just not sure what the hell she's talking about because she hasn't explained it. If you can trim that away, you can get to the heart of her thesis. It's like really, I wouldn't even say it's a full sentence. It's like part of one of her sentences is her thesis here. Can anybody try to hunt that down for us? I do think you can understand this part. This part where she says we um, created a prison to reunite the new Macy Finger and Chuck Carroll. Um, I don't know what that is. Part of that is her trying to sound fancy, creating a prism. You would rightfully say, what? But yeah, she's saying that when we see Vietnam, kind of like what I was saying a moment ago, when we see Vietnam, her point is that these books are saying, take that and now think about how that's probably more, uh, a better representation of war generally, right? All the movies you've seen, those are bullshit. So throw those out. Take what you think about Vietnam, whatever it is, what you're seeing on TV, that's closer to real. If you don't like it, or if it's ugly to you for some reason, it's hard for you to be like, yeah, about Vietnam. Well, now take that to World War II, she's saying, is what these books are doing. So we're seeing, we're re-seeing Vietnam, uh, World War II, rather, through this lens of Vietnam. That's her point. And she goes on to say, it undermines the privileged space that the good war occupies in America's cultural imagination. So we all think of a thing a certain way. An example I come back to a lot is when I envision LeBron James's life, I think it must be pretty sweet. I think he lives in a big house. If I wanted to be silly, I'd say he had a fridge full of Sprite and like he has his own basketball court and he just kind of does what he wants all goddamn day, right? And I think in some ways that's our cultural imagination of a guy like that. When in reality, I know a little bit, I don't know a lot. I'm, he and I aren't buddies, right? He's not calling me. In reality, parts of his life are probably still pretty awesome. Let's not get it twisted. Have you guys ever seen that guy's Instagram feed? He works out like a demon. Like, he puts in hard, hard work to look and play the way that he does, to be as good as he is, right? That's not really part of our cultural imagination when we think of a guy like that, right? We just like to focus on, in kind of the same way the Trafalgarians tell Billy, the beautiful things, the nice things. Look at this day, isn't it nice? Well, you had to work out like crazy hard and like kind of kill yourself on other days to get here. Don't look at that stuff. Look at the Instagram version, right? This is our cultural imagination. Her point is, these books are saying, we're doing the same thing to World War II. And it's completely inaccurate. We're missing so much when we just look at the movies. We need to think about it more realistically. See the darker elements. That's her thesis. Is they're trying to change, these books are trying to change that cultural imagination. Which is a hard thing to do. But that's what she's going to talk about in the paper. Okay? So everything she tells you in this article in some way is tied into that idea. This idea of a cultural imagination and how these books are trying to speak back to it. Right? And what I'm saying is, the last couple points I'll make. Yeah. Last couple points I'll make. Every paper you read is going to be built like that, okay? They all work the way we talk about uh, papers, the way I teach you to write papers, these are written the same way. You're not going to be able to understand everything you read, but you can pick out the important bits, if nothing else. You can do it, okay? The other thing I would tell you, and this is important, when you go to read this paper, I've said before, it's like 30 pages long, which is long. She has section headers. This is the part of the, uh, the start of her first section. I'm a child, I laugh at that. This is the start of her first section, about Slaughterhouse-Five. We read that book. I want you to read that section. I want you to read the introduction. I want you to read this section. Halfway through the article, she has another section that's about Gravity's Rainbow. We did not read that book. You do not have to read that section. It's like half the article. So I'm stressing this. You basically don't have to read half of this, okay? It's going to save you a lot of time. Somebody's not going to get that memo, and they're going to be upset. So again, there's a section header about halfway through the article. 
talks about Thomas Pynchon, talks about Gravity's Rainbow. You don't have to read that stuff. Throw it away, okay? Just the first half. And that's gonna be about this thesis, it's gonna be about this book. We're gonna use it in our papers. Any questions before I let you go? Yes, ma'am. Can you explain more about what's due on Saturday? What is due on Saturday? Is anything due on Saturday? Isn't, isn't there two? Yeah, that's what it is. They're due this Saturday? They very well could be. I thought that was next week. Are you sure that's not next week? I could be wrong about this, but I thought it was next week. I don't know how you get to this Saturday. I think it's next Saturday. Okay, sorry, I get confused. Yeah. No, you're good, man. You're good. What I would say about those. So it says in week eight, first two in service. But then it's not in week eight? I could have easily screwed that up. Is it in week nine? Does it say first or last there? Uh, it's one week nine, and it's from ten four to ten ten. No, no, no. But I'm saying the 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 thing to turn in the bibs in week nine. Does it say first bibs or last it's bibs? First bibs. Okay, I must have pushed it back and not changed it in the syllabus then. If it's like that, I I probably screwed so something it's up. Eight then. Yeah, like I I think originally I probably had it that way, and then I pushed it back a week when okay. I. So it's not bibs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're good. That's a fair question. Okay. We will talk about that more. That's we'll be able to. No, you're good. That, that's a fair question. Um, we'll be able to have a better conversation about it once we finish the book, which we're going to do for next time, and Jarvis, which we're also going to do next time. That's going to be in a video for Wednesday's class. No, you won't be here. Highly suggest you watch it. Then after we get these under our, our belts, we can talk more about the bibs. Well, do we have anything new on Saturday? No, I think we're just trying to get all this shit read. Okay. So finish the book. Read over the part of Jarvis you have to. What I will say about the bibs, this will help a little bit. One thing I didn't screw up on the prompt anyway is there steps you can do? So it's like the citation, a summary of the article, why you think the article would be useful. Like if you go through those steps, like you'll at worst have a really good start to a bib. So I'd at least do that. But any other questions you have, hopefully we'll address them. And if not, please bring them up. And that's all I got. I'll see you guys in a week. Thank you.